Hi everyone, welcome to the July 2000 edition of Wavelength. Well this summer heat is a constant reminder of the growing demand for electricity here in Central Texas. The LCRA has a new gas-fired power plant under construction in Bastrop County to help meet that new demand. And right next door, the Sim Gideon power plant is celebrating a milestone in its history. And thank you for all of the retirees that took their time and showed up today. LCRA employees and retirees gathered in June to celebrate the 35th anniversary of the startup of Unit 1 at the Sim Gideon power plant in Bastrop. The story of the Sim Gideon plant really began here at the state capitol. It took action by the Texas legislature in January 1962 to allow the LCRA to build the plant. When construction began on Unit 1 in 1963, it not only created jobs, it also created a lot of excitement in Bastrop County. The huge pieces of generating equipment rumbled into Bastrop by rail and were then transported to the plant site on special flatbed trucks, which sometimes needed a helping push. School was even let out in Bastrop so everyone could go see this rolling spectacle. And VIPs such as the plant's namesake, LCRA General Manager Sim Gideon, and board member Cecil Long also came out to have a look. Unit 1 went into commercial operations in May of 1965, adding 140 megawatts to LCRA's growing electric service area. Unit 2 was completed in 1968, and Unit 3 came online in 1971. These four men span the entire 35-year history of the Sim Gideon plant. They all served as plant manager. Ernest Jones worked at the old Kamau plant in New Braunfels. He moved back to Bastrop in 1963 as construction manager for the new plant. At that time, they really had to start anything. You're getting ready to start the lake. And I was in on that when they first started. And then I stayed on here as resident engineer until they started the first unit. And then I stayed on as plant superintendent. At the anniversary luncheon, the four men had a chance to reminisce and share a few stories. The thing that I remember the most is the, the fuel crisis in the 70s when uh, natural gas was no longer available on a, on a full-time basis and we had to fire fuel oil. And at that time I was an operator and uh, had a great responsibility in converting the plant from firing the natural gas and, into the fuel oil within an hour's notice from Sock Center. So that was, that was a pretty much of a memorable occasion for me. Dan Boone remembers what the site looked like on his first day on the job. A big hole in the ground out there and, <laughs> and, and concrete pouring everywhere. And if nothing else, they passed on to me just their leadership, their good work practices, and kind of gave me something to uh, uh, a target to shoot after. As in the early 60s, there's a buzz of activity here in Bastrop County with construction of Lost Pines Unit 1 in full swing. The first of two gas turbines is now on site, waiting to be lifted into position on the turbine deck. LCRA's affiliate Gentex and construction partner Calpine Corporation plan to have the 540 megawatt plant online by June of 2001, just in time to help meet the demands of a rapidly growing region. The need for what we do just increases day by day, and, and that, ought to, that ought to make you feel good, uh, if, if nothing else, about uh, job security and, and the need for the facilities that we have. Uh, the basic function of providing power and, and providing water and, and the recreation benefits that, that uh, LCRA provides is just going to be needed that much more in the future. It was the mid-1970s when the LCRA first got serious about protecting the water quality in the Colorado River. We began by ensuring that septic systems on the lakes and the river were properly built and maintained. In the 80s and the 90s, our mission included cleaning up the wastewater treatment plants and controlling runoff pollution. Today, the LCRA is undertaking a major study that will help us keep the river clean for the next generation of users. The LCRA has been collecting reservoir and stream samples at 70 locations along the Colorado since 1983, and they've been useful in determining the chemical makeup of the water. In the mid-1990s, they began assessing the aquatic resources of the river basin 
which has greatly added to the understanding of the overall quality of the Colorado River. And now the LCRA is embarking on the final element that will give them the most complete picture of the river that has ever been assembled. By combining a biological assessment of the river to the existing chemical and aquatic analysis, the LCRA will be in a position to better protect the resource in the future. And what we're doing out here is kind of bringing in, bringing in some other factors. I mean, uh, looking at the bug community as well as the fish community. You bring these three aspects together and you turn out a report on the Llano or the Colorado River Basin as a whole, you're getting a more, con in my opinion, you're getting a more comprehensive picture of what's going on in terms of your water quality and a better ability to monitor, um, you know, any potential problems. On a lonely and scenic stretch of the Llano River, a team of LCRA scientists are assembling to conduct another aquatic resource characterization study. They will look for clues in the water, clues in the silty river bottom, and clues along the banks. Each clue is part of a puzzle that will tell them just how healthy this tributary to the Colorado River is. Picking the best location to gather the information is important. The team settles into a spot where, thanks to recent rains, the current is flowing swiftly over the rocks. The first step is to look for fish, and the fastest way to get them is by electroshocking the water. The fish are immediately identified and entered into the field notes. They're very intolerant to pollution. They don't deal with pollution very well. So when you have darters in, in your streams, that means that the water quality is really good. And we see a lot of darters in the Llano, and that's really pleasing. After the electroshock, the more personal approach using seining nets provides additional samples. 57. The next step in the process is tedious, but perhaps the most important yeah, in determining the health of the river. This scientist is scooping mud and silt from the river bottom in search of the very tiniest of animals. Have to disturb the bottom to let the bugs let go of the rocks they're clinging on, and they'll get swept into the net and we'll pick out however many we need from there. It's now mid-morning and one of the last tasks is to look for animals that live along the shore and to measure the depth of the river. Point two four. The information gathered here on the Llano will be added to the previous aquatic resource characterizations that have been conducted. It's a big personal mission of our new general manager, Joe Beal to be a water quality leader and an environmental leader. I think LCRA has always been an environmental leader and continues to be. We just stepped a little bit out of the limelight for a while. We're stepping back in, but we're trying to do it in a way that is a little bit more friendly and in a way that will protect the resource, but also protect the rights of the people who live around the lakes and the river. The Texas Natural Resource Conservation Commission and the EPA are helping to fund the new biological assessment program, and the hope is that LCRA's efforts will establish a blueprint for other river authorities to follow. Before Buchanan Dam was completed, the LCRA began work on Inks Dam just three miles downstream. The idea was for the two dams to work in tandem, generating hydroelectricity and controlling floodwaters. Inks Dam was completed in 1938. It was designed with no floodgates and has one 14 megawatt generating unit. Now, after 62 years of service, Inks Dam is getting a structural makeover. It's all part of LCRA's 10-year, $50 million dam modernization program, which will ensure that all six Highland Lakes dams can withstand what scientists call the probable maximum flood, or PMF. This trenching machine is being used to shave four and a half feet off the crest of Inks Dam. Then a reinforced concrete beam will be placed in the cut. A total of 46 anchor holes will be drilled through the beam, all the way through the dam and 60 feet into the bedrock. Large wire cables will then be grouted into the holes and anchored to the concrete beam. Each cable will be stressed to 1 million pounds of force, which pulls the dam and the foundation together. Finally, the concrete crest will be re-poured on the dam. This design then takes into consideration those loads when we have a flood 
and will help the dam withstand that. As the dam stands today without any additional reinforcing, it could suffer some, some slippage, some movement in, in a probable maximum flood, 100 year, 500 year. And with the added anchors, the post-tensioning, the cabling process that we're in, involved with right now, we will enable ourselves to, to support the dam and prevent any problems. In a related project, the LCRA received a grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to reroute the pipeline which carries water from Inks Lake to the National Fish Hatchery. The pipe, which used to be strapped to the top of the dam, will now go through the dam so it doesn't catch debris during flood situations. All of this work at Inks Dam is scheduled to be complete by the end of the year. In other water cone news, employees of the dam and hydroelectric division have reached a safety milestone by working 10 years without a lost time accident. Now that's quite an accomplishment, especially when you consider these crews often work during storms and flooding situations. And the West Travis County Regional Water Supply System gained 80 new customers in June from the village of BK. These customers were formerly served by the city of Austin. We are said to be living in the information age. The internet, email, and satellites make ours a borderless society with instant communications possible worldwide. And in this high-tech competitive world, information is a very valuable commodity. How information is gathered, processed, used, stored, and disseminated by a company will have a huge impact on the cost of doing business and on how successful that business will be. In 1999, the Texas legislature passed Senate Bill 7, which restructured the electric power industry in the state. The bill opens up the industry to retail competition, meaning that consumers will be able to choose their electricity provider. This legislation also allows public power utilities like the Lower Colorado River Authority to protect competitive electric information that was once available to the public under the Texas Open Meetings and Open Records Act. Motion been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The LCRA Board of Directors created a policy which establishes findings and procedures to protect information related to competitive electric matters. The policy sets forth certain categories of information, including financial information, purchasing and contract information, business operations, and generation system operations. And it was really, I think, an effort by the legislature to level the playing field so that publicly owned utilities could play by the same set of rules in terms of keeping business secrets and competitive information confidential so that they're not at an unfair disadvantage with private utilities that aren't subject to the open records and open meetings laws. For the LCRA, this means some fundamental changes in the way business is conducted. Now we have entrepreneurs that are out there that have put v venture capital out to build units that want to maximize the return on those units. In the old days, it was a regulated industry based on cost. Now it's moving to a market-based industry where people are motivated by profits. And when they see the ability to get more for their product, whatever the circumstance is, they're going to take advantage of that. Information that used to be open and available to the general public, and indeed to other electric utilities, must now be viewed and handled in a completely different manner. We're going to have to evolve in the next year and a half to two years before 2002 is in place to lock ourselves down. What is appropriate security to have around that documentation and who in the company should have information and have access to that information? That's going to be a culture shock for a lot of folks. As a public entity, as LCRA has been very open amongst even our employees, amongst our coworkers, and to have to put security issues in place to protect some of that information is going to be a different way of doing business around here, and we're going to be required to do that. If competitive information is not labeled and handled internally as confidential, then it will be very difficult to protect that information from outside requests. So simply labeling something confidential isn't enough. If you've made 5,000 copies and sent it all over Central Texas, obviously it's not confidential because you haven't treated it that way. 
you have to treat that information by limiting access to it, not making too many copies, and managing that information in a way a private business would in terms of a trade secret or some other kind of competitive information. Instead, what I think you can do, what you must do, is... Diane Borska is an expert in the area of business intelligence. This session is part of a training course designed to educate these LCRA managers and supervisors in the importance of protecting competitive information. They should be very conscious of the fact that they do have knowledge about the operations of this company that are valuable and interesting and meaningful to a whole host of entities uh, out there in the marketplace. And as I said, to customers, to competitors, to prospective competitors, and even to strategic partners. Of course, it's not just paper documents that have to be protected. In the new e-world, digital and electronic information, such as voicemail, email, and internet data, must also be included in the competitive information category. It's so easy to send an email message to a wide-ranging group of folks uh, if you send it to a group. Uh, and if you're dealing with electric competitive matters, we have to be particularly careful that that record, because that's what it is, uh, is sent just to those people who need to see it. Um, that's one of the risks, uh, the downside of electronic communications these days is it's awfully easy to send a single message to hundreds, if not thousands of people inadvertently. Deregulation of the electric power industry at the retail level will officially begin in Texas January 2002. It will be a vastly different world of marketing and advertising campaigns aimed at getting your home or business signed up as an electric customer. Just call this toll-free number to choose Exelon as your electric supplier. And it will be a world where finding out as much as possible about the competition will be the norm. The LCRA will be rolling out training classes designed specifically for each line of business and new security measures will be implemented to protect this competitive information. But if you ever have any questions about how certain information should be treated, ask your supervisor or manager. The entire board policy concerning competitive electric information is available on the LCRA intranet at oneco.lcra.org. Right now, information stewards representing various departments within Genco, Hydro, and Corporate Services are surveying all employees who create, modify, or handle competitive electric information. They're tracking what information each person has access to and where it goes from there. This process will help determine just how confidential information is handled in the future. It has become one of the most popular events on the LCRA calendar. It's the annual LCRA Scholarship Awards Luncheon. For the year 2000, these 12 outstanding students from all over the region are being recognized for their academic achievements as well as their community involvement. The program would not have started 13 years ago without the vision and the support of the LCRA Board of Directors. We are proud of the success of this program. Over the past 13 years, LCRA has awarded over a million dollars in scholarships. Each scholarship recipient receives $3,000 a year, plus a summer internship at the LCRA. As you enter this new chapter, as you start out in your college career, that uh, we are always here thinking about you. We expect you to do well. Uh, we'll be looking forward to your doing well, and we'll be watching over your shoulder. So have a good time, uh, learn a lot, and uh, thank you for being the fine students that you are. This year's scholarship winners are Elizabeth Bredeman from Lexington High School in Lee County. She will study communications at the University of Texas. Andrew Glick from Columbus High School will study construction science at Texas A&M. Sarah Hudson from Bernie High School plans to attend Rice University. Travis Knight from Burnett High School will study computer technology at UT. Luis Moreno graduated from Seguin High School and will attend Texas Lutheran University where he will major in sports medicine. Melissa Palashik from Columbus High School plans to study nursing at Blinn Junior College. Natalie Pounds from San Marcos High will attend UT and major in business. Lindsay Ziriax from Mason High will attend the business school at Southwest Texas State University. 
And Aaron Randall, who graduated from Bowie High School in Austin, plans to study communications at UT. Aaron received one of two scholarships awarded to the child of an LCRA employee. Aaron's mom, Renee Randall, works in community assistance and volunteer services. And this is going to help both of us a lot. Being a single parent, the scholarship is going to help her go through college and help her financially where I couldn't. So it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for us. I'm ecstatic. I'm very grateful and appreciative of the scholarship. I'd also like to give my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you know, the thanks because I feel like this is actually a blessing to me to have them choose me, you know, as one of the scholarship recipients. It will be a tremendous benefit when I go to college and getting everything, my education and my school, my my books and all that I need for college for four years. And then the internship over the summer, it, um, I'll be working, I'm working a computer intern, the technology intern under Bruce Wilson over the summer. So I know last summer I learned quite a bit. So this summer I'm hoping to learn quite a bit more. And I, I've always liked the field of computers. So maybe it'll, it'll give me some experience hands on and it'll help me be able to advance myself in that field a little bit more if possible. Jamie Lynn Muskie, Stephen Torres, and Ryan Watipka also received scholarships but were unable to attend the ceremony. Congratulations to all of the LCRA scholarship winners. It was a festive setting as hundreds of volunteers from Burnett County assembled for the American Cancer Society's Relay for Life fundraiser. Just inside the track, teams set up base camps in which volunteers would alternate turns walking around the track for 16 straight hours, each lap adding up to dollars for the American Cancer Society. We'd like to see cancer go away. And it's expensive, and the only way to battle it's with money, and that's what we're trying to do is collect every dime we can for the research. A lot of us have lost people to cancer, family, friends, and it's just our goal to wipe it out. River Rat Team 14 Koga. The T.C. Ferguson plant and the dam and hydro facilities each have a major presence in Burnett County. They showed their support by organizing two teams and a total of 29 volunteers. And it was only natural that the theme of their base camp centered around the river. The Burnett County Relay for Life event is designed to celebrate the lives that have been saved due to medical advances and to pay tribute to the lives that have been lost due to cancer. Overall, the event raised $40,000, with the LCRA team contributing 4000 of the total. For many volunteers, the Relay for Life helps them as much as it does the Cancer Society. Ferguson Power Plant manager Marion Nichols lost his mother to cancer. Cancer is just something that strikes everybody. Uh, I lost my mother just last December to cancer, and you know you just don't know of anybody or talk to anybody that hadn't been affected by cancer one way or another. Diane Orison and Viola Bales met while receiving chemotherapy in the hospital. As survivors of cancer, they share a unique bond. She was kind of sad, so I gave her an angel pen right here, and. That just helped her. We just started talking then, and we just looked forward to being with each other when we were taking chemo. As night fell over the stadium, the party-like atmosphere gave way to a more reverent and serene tone. Each of the luminaries represents a loved one whose life was lost to cancer, and the hope that another one might be saved. When word finally reached Texas that the Civil War was over and all slaves were free, it was cause for celebration. That day, June 19, 1865, became known as Juneteenth and represents the oldest known celebration of the ending of slavery in this country. In 1980, the Texas legislature made Juneteenth an official state holiday. This June, the LCRA held its second annual Juneteenth celebration in the shadow of the Fayette Power Project in LaGrange. The fact that everybody's here today celebrating Juneteenth and the fact that you have leadership in your organization 
that will stand up to you and explain to you and explain to the employees about the 19th of June indicates that we are coming to a better world and that things are going to get a lot better. Juneteenth is also gaining popularity nationally as a celebration of African American heritage while encouraging self-development and respect for all cultures. What Juneteenth means uh, to me is remembering my past, what my foreparents have gone through to help me get to where I am today, remembering the bridge that brought me over, and just diversifying with different people and acknowledging that people are different and we can work together and people have different ideas and just because you have one idea doesn't mean that that's the right idea to go with. If you put all the, all the ideas together in one big pile and work from there and sharing and learning together and working as a team, that's the most important, working as a team. We have a golden opportunity to be able to springboard from an activity like this and prepare for those demographic changes by understanding one another better and by seeing what we as a company can do to build upon our workforce, to build upon our customers' needs, and to work together for common costs. You can find out more about the history and future of Juneteenth on the web at www.juneteenth.com. As our weather heats up, water levels at Lake Travis are going down, and that could mean bad news for boaters and lake goers during the upcoming 4th of July holiday weekend. KB24's Quita Culpepper has more on that story. Quita, I know the situation has the authorities concerned. How, how bad is it? Judy, it's starting to reach the critical stage. Right now, Lake Travis is nearly 20 feet lower than it's supposed to be, and that has the Lower Colorado River Authority taking no chances. It wants to get the word out that bringing a boat to Lake Travis on the upcoming holiday weekend may leave you stranded on shore for quite a while. This is a new little rig we just bought a couple of weeks ago, and this is going to be our first trip here in Lake uh, Travis with it today. It's anchors away for Bob Jones and his daughter, Alyssa. But low lake levels have them worried. It's because you don't know where all the sandbars are all the time. And just, it's horrible how low it is. It amazes me that it's down so low. Because I came out here last year all the time to swim here. And I remember how high up the water was. The last time Lake Travis was this low was about August of 1996. Recent rains helped a little, but not enough of it ended up in Lake Travis. Out of the 12 public boat ramps that are on Lake Travis, only two of those remain open. The rest of the boat ramps are out of the water and boaters can't get their boats down to the water using those. And that's going to mean big problems over the 4th of July weekend, one of the lake's busiest times of the year. There are probably going to be some pretty long lines out at Mansfield Dam Park and at Jones Brothers Park where those two public boat ramps are. That news has some boaters hitting the lake now. Yeah, that's why we're out here on a Tuesday. And planning a holiday celebration on shore. Are you going to be out here on the 4th of July? I doubt it. Why? Doubt it. Too crowded. The LCRA says the lake is going to keep dropping about a foot a week. And it's not just a lack of rain that's causing the problem. The LCRA is under contract with rice farmers and has to let water leave Lake Travis and head downstream for irrigation. Judy. Thank you, Quita. Again, only two public boat ramps are still open at Lake Travis. They can be found in Mansfield Dam Park and Jones Brothers Park. People can still use a marinas or private docks to get their boats into Lake Travis.